Welcome everyone, my name is Anne Lord, Librarian at the Australian Wine Research Institute and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. It is also my pleasure to welcome today's pre presenter, Colin Hinsey, Vineyard Manager at Taylor's Wines. In this webinar, Colin will discuss the challenges and successes at Taylor's Wines since introducing precision viticulture techniques into their vineyard operations. Before I hand over to Colin, I have a couple of quick points as to what to expect for those who are new to AWRI webinars. The format for, day, for today is a short presentation followed by a Q&A. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view via the AWRI website. It is important to remember that webinars are interactive and that there are a number of ways to get involved. To ask a question, please type into the question section of your control panel in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. For those with access to a microphone, there is also the option of speaking directly with our presenter by clicking the raise hand button. This is located in the top left section of your control panel. Please feel free to send through questions at any time as well as during the Q&A session and I'll get as many questions through to Colin as possible. Finally, if you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at a the underscore AWRI. Okay, that's enough from me now. I'm going to hand over to Colin to tell us more about today's topic. Thanks Anne, just setting up the display now. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation from the AWRI to speak today. Um, the presentation uh, today is based on uh, one given at a group of growers in northeastern Victoria back in June of this year. Um, and it is uh, somewhat similar to uh, a presentation in McLaren Bowl back in 2014. So, for those that might have been at either of those presentations, there will be some similar content, but nonetheless um, still relevant today, I hope. Um, so we'll get straight into it. Um, essentially, uh, our history of adoption at Taylor's um, goes back, uh, begins in 2014, uh, sorry, 2004. Uh, EM38 was first used at this property to um, try and identify areas on the property that were at higher risk of waterlogging. Uh, that was part of the justification process required uh, for using imported water in the Clare Valley. So um, the first mapping efforts uh, go back to uh, 2004. Um, it's now a fairly integral part of our vineyard redevelopment program, which I will speak to uh, later in the presentation. In 2006, uh, we grabbed our first plant cell density image using glide aircraft uh, to give us some bigger mapping and to help identify vine variability. And uh, also in 2006 vintage was our first year of uh, using grape yield mapping. Uh, we, we have uh, two harvesters, two of our own harvesters that we use here on site. So we started with one of the two harvesters. Um, 2007 we installed the second yield monitor uh, to give us coverage of the whole property. Um, speak first about the, the challenges. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but um, just to give an idea of the kind of things that uh, come at you with um, precision viticulture techniques. Um, because it provides such a level of detailed information, it requires time and focus um, from essentially someone from within the management team of, of the vineyards. So um, it's, a, it's an ongoing, it's a constant learning process uh, and it, it requires um, some part of a dedicated resource either from within your team or, or perhaps with a, uh, a business partner, a uh, consultant or advisor if you like. We found at the, our property here in Clare that some of our split harvest opportunities have been limited. Sometimes that's because the um, difference between the high and the low within the same block 
may not justify uh, a different um, wine grade, for example. Uh, other times, it's simply the logistics of harvest um, that force your hand in terms of the speed and rate of um, bringing the fruit in. Hardware capabilities, in that regard, I'm talking probably most specifically about um, the grape yield monitors, um, the very nature of uh, machine harvesting grapes being a, a wet, sticky compound. Um, we do have issues with harvester um, discharge conveyor blockages and uh, um, malfunctioning of equipment and those sorts of things. We, we're continually trying to improve that uh, capability, but uh, nonetheless, uh, data errors do happen in yield mapping, which can be frustrating. And um, it's certainly not unique to Precision Bit and Precision Ag, um, but software and the many different alternatives of software can be a bit of a minefield. So um, it's often uh, you want to stick with a single product where possible, but uh, sometimes you need to use multiple software programs to get the outcome that you need. Uh, again, having a, um, a good third party and external partner uh, in this, is, this has been uh, very important for us at Taylor's as well. I'll just quickly run through um, some examples of successes uh, by means of a, a case study. So we have had some split picking opportunities. Um, for example, um, Shiraz being a, a major variety that we, we grow and, and produce into wine, we've got a, a, a wider range of products that we can put those into. So roughly speaking, about 85% of what we grow may end up in the, uh, the traditional, what we call the estate Shiraz product, uh, which I've just called C for the sake of um, putting it in a level. 10% of what we grow we might be targeting for B and, and maybe 5% into A. Uh, so there's an opportunity for finding those quality parcels and elevating them. So um, as an example, here's a uh, block of Shiraz, this is a bit over 16 hectares, what you're looking at here on screen. Um, for those that have a, a keen eye, uh, the, the red in this is indicating the, the lowest, bigger patches of the block. Um, green is about moderate and, and the bluer sections are the heaviest, bigger, the largest canopies, if you like. Um, that in itself may not appear too obvious, but we can go through a process of actually zoning the, the block. We can simplify the map. To, uh, to, to to whatever complexity you'd like, but if you want to try and simplify it into the lowest, the middle and the high, um, then you can start to perhaps identify nearly a hectare of uh, the highest bigger area that you may want to exclude perhaps, um, or you might go particularly looking in that lowest bigger area for something unique or something to stand out. So the use of zoning the data can certainly help simplify the map that you're looking at. If we go back. Got the, the vine only data there through to the zone image there. Merlot, on the other hand, um, not so much the opportunity for, for different quality grades. At this point in time, we just have a single Merlot product that comes out of the Clare Valley, so we're only looking to hit one particular price point. But that doesn't mean that there's not opportunities in split picking. Um, here we have a, a number of adjacent blocks that, sit, uh, that are draped over a hill, essentially. Uh, and again, red for low through to, to blue for high. There's quite a range of um, vine canopy sizes and structures within this. Uh, and so it, in this particular scenario, um, I knew I had uh, two uh, fermenters uh, to fill uh, when picking this section. And so really quite simply what we did is we isolated the predominantly low bigger areas, made sure they were harvested first, um, delivered into one fermenter, and then the rest of the fruit could be delivered into the other fermenter all on the same day. Um, but it gave the winemaking team um, an opportunity to treat those vessels differently if they saw fit to do so. Um, so you're not having one big um, homogenous, you're still trying to separate the parcels and deal with them separately. Um, in terms of um, research and development and internal trials, the precision viticulture tools um, certainly give us a way of measuring the impact of, of trials. So as an example here, uh, one of the blocks, uh, again of Shiraz in this case, we set up a, a mulch trial, um, straw, you can see an image in the top left, um, composted organic mulch in the top right, and uh, traditional uh, bare uh, under vine strip is the bottom image. And so we've replicated 
those pairs of rows um, right across um, about a nine hectare block as a whole of block experiment, for example. So there's there's an image of the block. Um, I think this image is from 2012, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, and uh, once you've got an idea of the trial design, you can start to isolate um, particular pairs of rows and uh, using software tools to analyse the impact of uh, straw versus traditional, the impact of mulch versus traditional, as well as you know, harvesting from those trials and, and looking at actual yield outcomes. You, you might isolate, might identify a part of the block where applying mulch is a detrimental effect, for example, where you don't want to apply such a treatment. So that can be quite useful in a whole of block trial design. Um, we also um, like to partner with uh, researchers uh, and with One Australia funded projects. So uh, here's an example of an ongoing project at the moment. Um, this is just a single snapshot where we're looking at mapping yield um, versus mapping potential quality parameters. So um, how does the relationship between yield and quality relate. So that's just a single example of how um, using these um, precision viticulture tools can assist with the, the research and development uh, efforts and our, um, our research funding. In terms of block troubleshooting, um, we can all identify um, underperforming blocks or areas of concern, um, I guess by having, a, by having an image to, to reference back to. Uh, you can start to target soil pit locations, for example. This is a fairly coarse example, but it just gives an idea about where we've positioned some investigation soil pits, for example, and to start looking at uh, root, uh, vine root uh, restrictions or, or the contributing factors to why we're having performance issues. So it um, doesn't change the viticultural practices that we apply. It's, they're just not done on a whole block basis. They're, they're targeted to a particular part of the block. Again, like the split picking, you could zone the map uh, to give you low, medium and high and you can do some specific targeting of areas. Which leads on to um, moisture probe locations. Um, this is a, a quite a specific example of where we can use layers of information to identify a spot within the vineyard. So um, in this particular instance, that's an overhead of the, um, the entire property. Of, uh, Tailors there, so we're going to focus on the block, which you can see colourful pretty much in the centre there. Um, so, in this in this instance, we have a number of data layers uh, background that we can use. And what we're trying to do is work out where is the best place in this block to locate a permanently logging soil moisture probe. So we have plant soil density uh, history, uh, giving us the idea of the the size and the health of the canopy. We have um, soil variability mapped using EM38 and we also have uh, terrain information, so the slope and the aspect uh, which can influence surface and subsurface water movement. So the PCD from 2014, we can see we've got higher vigour and lower vigour areas and the variability of that vigour map is around the 41% um, as a coefficient variation. One thing we can do is take multiple years of, of data, so the uh, 2014, 2015, 2016 uh, plant cell density maps and uh, you can turn that into an average uh, of those three seasons. You can see the general structure of that map is, is very, very similar uh, and, and again simplify that even further into a three zone model, high, medium, low. Next thing we can do is have a look at the differences in, in soil variability. So um, using the EM38 uh, survey that was done uh, in 2015, we've got actually two layers of information that, that we chose to utilise in this case. One is the conductivity of the EM38 deep, so um, we've got some small patches of higher conductivity uh, and the majority of the block is quite lower conductivity. We understand that. Um, higher conductivity area, for example, to be related to a, um, a clay pan sort of uh, patch within the block. On the right-hand side of the screen is the uh, in-phase uh, in -phase, in -phase readout, which gives an indication of the magnetic properties of the soil, which is almost a, a pseudo-measurement of the uh, 
element make up in the soil. So um, similar but different distribution of soil variability properties, something to take into consideration. So using that, the EM38, the average plant cell density, which is effectively the plants giving you our response to growing in the soil and the info is deep. As layers, we can also then drape that over the topography. So that's the um, the slope and the, and the contour lines of the block. Um, it's it's draped over a 3D image. It's a may not be easy to see necessarily, but it's looking at the, the block almost from side on. From that elevation model, we can look at the preferential water flow um, from a surface point of view. So uh, if that was a solid surface, how would water flow across that surface? You can see there's concentrated the areas where, where water might collect. We combine that to uh, give us the potential for water logging and water accumulation. And that actually relates quite closely to that infield in phase uh, distribution of the EM38. So there's, there's something going on there with the terrain and the soil properties and the way they relate. Remembering that what we're trying to do is find the ideal location for a soil moisture probe. So taking those five layers of information, uh, four layers of information to account, um, the software has come up with two possible recommended locations for uh, monitoring soil moisture relative to this block. And we can even take that the next step further, um, have that as an iPad application, um, just using the basic GPS function within the iPad to, to locate where we're going to locate the soil moisture probe. So quite a powerful setup of information rather than arbitrarily going two panels in on row 20, for example. Um, the last main topic I'll talk to is in relation to vineyard redevelopment. Um, Again, this is something that's come out of some research and development trial work that was done in partnership with CSRO and funded by the then GWRDC. This, this image here shows that the vineyard, uh, as it was previously planted in the uh, early 80s, um, the layout was based on having uh, long rows um, and fundamentally a lot of the raw orientation was done across the side of the slope. So using the multi-layer um, analysis, um, and all the background information that we had available to us, we've gone with, uh, again, EM38, that soil variability mapping as being a fundamental uh, layer of information. The slope, uh, meaning you know, how, how, that, how steep the, the soil, that uh, part of the block is. And TWI is the topographic wetness index, so that gives an indication of um, how much up, uh, uphill land there is that would be collecting water and distributing that into this area. So it um, does relate quite closely with the slope, but also the position on the slope. And that's given us three um, main zones that you can see there in the yellow, pink, and blue. So if we were to read in terms of redesigning this patch from scratch, it gives us a couple of points of delineation to really consider. Um, there's two main areas um, circled, which are, relatively speaking, much flatter areas of land. Um, they also have a, a much higher EM38 at conductance level, um, all other things being equal, suggesting a higher soil texture. Um, whereas uh, then there's also, between the yellow and the pink zones, there's, there's some change happening there. Uh, mainly related to the slope. The pink areas are relatively flat compared to the uh, yellow areas with a higher slope. So if we use those limiting factors for our vineyard redesign, that's where we can start to uh, separate uh, plantings, uh, separate valves. Um, the dotted lines there are essentially close to the brows of the hill where we can um, isolate um, blocks in different orientations. So um, you can see if I flip back, how the, the previous design was laid out in contrast to our newer design. And so the areas that are shaded in uh, have currently been planted um, between 2011, 2013 and 2014 and uh, you know, 
going forward in the future, those other areas um, may well be planted as well, depending on the business need. And we're hoping that in uh, in some years' time, once those blocks are, are fully established and and uh, growing well, we can come back and actually analytically measure their variability and have we ended up reducing the variability within each block, but actually optimising the variation between those blocks. So that's something that'll be be there for a future analysis. So that pretty much brings me to the end of the, the formal presentation. Uh, the, the main intent is just to give uh, everyone a, a feel for what uh, can be um, some practical outcomes um, with using precision viticulture techniques. So I'll hand back to you for a minute, Anne. Thank you, Colin. Now, just to remind you to ask a question, please type into the question section of your control panel in the bottom right corner of your screen. And for those of you who have a microphone, there's also the option of speaking directly with our presenter by raising, clicking the raise hand button, which is located in the top left section of your control panel. Now, I have noticed that Pauline Cast Castani has got her hand raised and I was just wondering if, Pauline, do you have, I've, I've unmuted your microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, maybe I'll go to Frederick Pilcher. Frederick, I've just unmuted your microphone if you'd like to ask a question now. Hello, Frederick. Okay, I'm just going to send through a question now to Colin. And Colin, your microphone's unmuted. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so a question from uh, Andrew Naylor. Uh, can you give us an idea of the capital expense initially and maybe ongoing partner costs annually? Okay, great question. Um, it's actually been some time since I've had to buy new equipment uh, in terms of uh, great viewer monitor and uh, GPS equipment. Uh, from the top of my head, I think we were looking at around about uh, $25,000 per harvester to set up a great viewer monitor, but that's, that's quite old numbers, so um, that could be completely different um, for, for these days. Um, the GPS equipment can also be utilised. Um, in the off season, if you want to set up a, a portable unit to uh, do some um, block boundary mapping, or we use them for pegging out new vineyards and things like that, so the GPS equipment can be utilised further year round, uh, and you could also couple them up with uh, spray units if you wanted to be monitoring spray applications too. So a GPS unit can have multiple uses for sure. Um, most of the other costs are actually annual costs. So um, for us, the, um, the remote sensing, the, the plant cell density capture, uh, comes in around the $35 a hectare mark um, to, to get that uh, snapshot of information. Um, and we don't necessarily do that on every block either. Um, we, we do that a little bit more strategic uh, in terms of where we think we can get value from that. Um, to get a, a fully detailed uh, EM38 and terrain or topography map that's done as a single pass um, by a service provider, uh, that cost us in the order of about $40 a hectare as a final delivered product and that's really a, a one-off cost. It's information that doesn't change, your, your hillsides don't change, so that's a, a constant in your information flow. Um, and uh, in 
terms of consultancy or advisor fees, um, we're probably spending in the order of um, two to three thousand dollars a year on some data processing and, and basic um, advisor costs because we've got a couple of viticultural staff on site here. We, we do a lot of the technical work in house. If you did want to have a, um, a viticulturist business partner, obviously that might um, cost a bit more. Andrew's posted a follow-up question uh, to that in terms of um, payback. Uh, also, is there a figure in terms of payback that you think could be presented to the finance teams? Um, I, again, I, I don't really have a number in, in mind. We've got to the point where that's been built in as, a, as an integral part of, of doing the business. So, um, for a, for a uh, property of our scale, um, you know, we're probably looking at less than one percent of our uh, annual operating cost being able to directly contribute to precision viticulture tools, kind of thing. So um, that gives a bit of an idea, I suppose, on um, the investment per hectare. It doesn't specifically answer your question. Andrew, did you want to speak directly with Colin? I've just unmuted your microphone if you'd like to. Yeah, hopefully um, you can hear this, Colin. Um, in terms of a yield monitor on a harvester, if you were embarking on this again, would you continue by purchasing a yield monitor, do you think, or would you just stick with your EM38, your remote sensing, and, and maybe some on-ground ground truthing? Yeah, there's a fairly strong relationship between the the, the Vigor map, the plant cell density map, and the um, and your, your resultant yield. Uh, ground truthing um, is essential, as you sort of alluded to there. Um, a, a map will always look variable because it gives you from the lowest reading to the highest reading. So, um, simply a click of the mouse um, can apply colours however however you like to a map. So every map will look variable. Ground truthing that um, is something that I can't really speak to at all is, is critical because uh, you need to know what low means in this particular situation, what medium means, what high means. Um, yield mapping, um, I want to say yes, I'd continue with it. Um, ongoing technical issues uh, are a bit of a drawback. Uh, works in my situation because we own the harvesters as well, um, so we can persevere um, with that, but it can be can be problematic. We are at a bit of a crossroad where we're looking at um, harvest technology sometime down the, down the path and um, you know, some of the new harvest technology doesn't actually lend itself very easily towards having your monitors on them anyway, uh, onboard bin configurations and things like that. So that is certainly one of our considerations for the future. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And my, my apologies for sounding a little bit financially focused. Um, there's another question, but you can mute my microphone for now while I think about it and get it get it right. Yep. It's quite valid to, to consider the finances. Um, the, the key driver for what we're doing is to improve the vineyard productivity. So uh, by understanding where your limitations are, you can you can either lift lift them uh, or optimise the difference. So um, that they're your two fundamental choices when you when you're dealing with vineyard variability. Do do you look to improve the uniformity, which is, I guess, what we're trying to do in terms of our redevelopment program, um, or do you, or, or, and do you exploit the differences? That's where you take your split picking and, and picking the eyes out of an existing block and those kinds of things. And you know, we wouldn't be doing this if we weren't looking for an ultimate financial return on that. Absolutely. Yeah, I certainly enjoyed that um, map that you put up of the the redevelopment options once you'd run a a sort of a layered or an EM38 and your PCD imagery across it. Um, certainly gives us something to think about as well. Um, did you have any thoughts on, you had a, a vineyard map there with a number of blocks on it um, and the one that you'd highlighted had a CV of about 41%. Did you have any thoughts on how your blocks all compare from a coefficient of variation and, and which ones you, how you went about targeting which ones to hit first and with what? Uh, yeah, 
I don't really have um, that down as a number. That's an interesting uh, prospect to take that through to. You know, we have tables of information of historical yield performance and, and cost on a per block basis. Um, that's probably quite an interesting factor to calculate the coefficient of variation for each of our blocks. And, uh, you've got a, a number to chase. Um, fundamentally, where do we start? Um, the quick wins are sometimes quite obvious, um, and um, but but other times, yeah. It, every block you look at will look variable. It's a matter of whether there's a, a, a justification to, to, to do something about that. So our biggest advantage from a long-term point of view, because we are redeveloping our, our vineyard asset and, and have been for 10 years, um, that opportunity to redesign and um, realign the vineyards, because you know we. With them for, for 20 to 30 years, hopefully. So um, you getting the design right up front is uh, is pretty critical. Mm. Yeah, no, very good, very good pro presentation. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Andrew. Do we have any more questions? Uh, yeah, I was just about to ask if anyone would like to ask any more questions because we've uh, we don't have any questions just at the minute. Oh, hang on, Frank's got a question. Frank, I'm going to unmute your microphone now so you can speak with Colin. Uh, thanks, Colin. Um, just like we we're in a much smaller vineyard, and I'm just wondering. Um, if you know, we haven't done any uh, precision work at all, um, if you had, uh, if you hadn't started on this yet, um, or sort of thinking back to before you did start, how much of what you've discovered do you think you would have known already from just being uh, very familiar with your vineyard, versus how much uh, have you discovered things that you you wouldn't otherwise have been aware of? Sure. Thanks, Frank. Um, I guess the scale. Uh, and intimate knowledge of the vineyard um, certainly go somewhat hand in hand. Um, I guess 2006 was when I was also new to, to this business and to the property. So for me, coming in cold and, and being unfamiliar, it was an obvious starting point for me to you know, grab that image around and start to build the database, uh, the data set, if you like. Um, sometimes uh, you don't know what information you need until you don't have it. So um, I probably was always at that philosophy of, of, of getting getting up to speed quite quickly. Vineyards by their nature of being a row crop, um, we can pretty much do precision, but we can locate to the vine fairly easily because it's yeah, row 17 and the 20th vine from the northern end. So they being permanent plantings, we, a small operation um, with owner operator or minimal staff, you do get to quite intimately know the, the high and the low areas and you're, you're ground truthing all the time. Um, did we learn anything new? I don't think we've learned anything new. What the, what the analysis tools gives us is, um, I guess, a, not only a target point for uh, measuring and understanding, but also an idea of the scale. So um, you, you understand that Maybe the southwest corner of a block is up on the hillside and it's got shallow soil, so it's always going to be lower vigour. Um, but to what extent should you apply some mulch to that corner? How far um, should you come? So instead of being intuitive, it can be a little more uh, measured and analytical. So certainly at the scale we're on, um, that was pretty critical for me as part of the management team so to really get a handle on that. As I said, a smaller operation, uh, you may well have a good feel for that just by the nature of um, being a lot more involved in that property. Does that sort of answer the question, Frank? Yeah, that's great. No, I wasn't trying to suggest that it wasn't a good thing to do, I was just curious. Uh, uh, but yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Frank. Are there any more questions?
Well, we don't seem to have any more questions. Oh, hang on, we have a question. And this one's from Andrew Naylor again. Okay, thanks Andrew. He's written through a question, um, how have the winemaking team bought into this? Uh, Good question. The um, Taylor's winemaking team uh, has been quite open to um, suggestion and um, throughput. The, they haven't been involved in the field side of things and that's um, except for obviously uh, pre-harvest fruit selection and, and those kinds of things. Where we've uh, identified potential parcels, they've certainly been uh, an integral part in evaluating fruit. Uh, immediately prior to harvest and the lead up to, to harvest um, and we, we work on a consensus based approach of um, whether there's a, a quality difference so uh, and uh, obviously that all ties in with, with harvest logistics as well. We might be able to narrow down a, a, yeah, a five tonne parcel of, uh, of fruit for example but if it's too small it, it just still needs to match the logistics of harvest and available vessels for ferment and all those kinds of things. So um, the winery, the winemaking team haven't certainly driven uh, us from a, a quality increase point of view or anything like that. Uh, it's probably more from the vineyard we're providing some push uh, into the winery to say okay here's something different or this is what we've done to try and give you uh, what you're asking for. Uh, Andrew, I've just unmuted your microphone if you want to add anything to the question. Yeah, I was just uh, about to say thanks very much for the uh, for the webinar um, and yeah, very uh, good thoughts, Colin. Lots of um, things there to, to I, put, I guess put into the mix. Um, you know, we've got a, a very large vineyard holding over here, um, spread across quite a part of a region, and variability uh, is pretty much a given on our soils, so it's really a case of um, you know, which parcels do you tackle first? Is it the ones that are really variable with lots of little bits of variability or is it the block that's got a small piece of variability but it's a massive difference? Um, and those you know, logically would be the ones you'd tackle first. Um, but yeah, just, just uh, I was going to say thanks very much. Um, I've got a little computer voice that tells me when you've unmuted my microphone for me as well. A little bit disconcerting. Okay, thank you Andrew. Are there any more questions? Well there don't seem to be any more questions coming through. Is there anything you'd like to add Colin? Uh, thanks Anne. Look, uh, no that's been uh, great. I've uh, enjoyed the interaction there, um, particularly with um, Andrew and Frank there, so thanks very much for the questions. Um, obviously my uh, contact detail uh, my email there is still on the screen, so uh, if you did want to, anyone wanted to um, throw me a question or, or have a catch up sometime, I'd be more than open to that. Um, and uh, again, thanks to the AWRI for the invitation to speak today. Thank you. Back to you, Anne. Thank you, Colin. Okay, thank you Colin for presenting today and thank you also to everyone who attended and took part in today's session. For attendees, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording and a link to a survey. The next AWRI webinar is the 15th of September when Roberta DeBay from the University of Adelaide will present Canopy Management Using Grower-Friendly Digital Tools. If you would like to register for this webinar, please visit the AWRI website. That's all we have for today. Thank you for attending and I look forward to seeing you again at the next AWRI webinar.